Oh, here he goes again on this brilliant overcast day, talking in his car. Yep, and I'm sick, so you're going to hear a lot of this. <clears throat> yeah, cough it up. Today, we're going to talk about user interfaces, and there's one specific thing that I would really like to talk about regarding user interfaces. It's a major pain point, and um, yeah, oh great. You know, doing these videos while driving is not necessarily the most fun thing. Um, because there's always some asshole in a Mercedes. And I'm going to make sure that they suffer while they pass. Wow, that smell of cow shit that suddenly appeared after the Mercedes went by. I wonder if that's related. Anyway... Um, on to the discussion. I have talked way too much about silly things. One of the biggest problems that I have with modern user interfaces is not really... It's not even like the visual effects or, you know, the, the gloss or the flatness. It's actually a consistency issue. This became an issue in Windows 10. And it, um, well, with Windows 8, really, but... <coughs> With Windows 10, it became um, it became a constant to just screw around with the interface. So every time you would get a feature update to Windows 10, you didn't know if a settings panel location would change. The behavior of a settings panel would change. A particular setting would be removed from the control panel without the setting be a being added back to the settings panel. You didn't know if certain programs were going to be changed in certain ways. Um, for example, a very recent thing that has changed is Microsoft has completely revamped Notepad. And I hate it. Notepad, the beauty of Notepad was always that it was a very small, simple, fast, um, bare bones, just no frills, uh, everything in Notepad behaved in a consistent, reliable way type of program. If you needed more than Notepad, well, you'd run WordPad or, God, anything, really, other than Notepad. You'd install some other fancy editor, you know, Visual Studio Code, or, in my case, I prefer Vim. But you'd, you'd use something other than Notepad if you needed more than what Notepad did. But Notepad was great for just real quick, go in, edit a text file, save it, be done. <coughs> yes, Notepad is somewhat lacking in features. But you know what? The beauty of Notepad was that it was simple and consistent. And then Microsoft decided it was time to completely redo Notepad. Well, the problem is that Notepad is now a modern application with a bunch of weird behaviors that piss me off. I don't even remember the exact ones. It's just all around annoying compared to the original. And one of the problems is that it changed. It changed at all. It's, it's fucking notepad. It's not, we're not talking about like Eclipse here. We're not talking about Visual Studio Code or, or NetBeans or or any of these stupid integrated development environments that are all complex and constantly having little minor things changed around, you know, evolving to suit needs. We're talking about Notepad. Notepad's literal job is open a plain text file, edit plain text, have basic features like find and replace, and maybe word wrap, and that's it. Notepad has one job and it does that one job well. It's arguably one of the only programs that's a standard part of Windows that adheres to the Unix philosophy. Do one thing, do that thing well, be done with it. <coughs> Un yeah, unfortunately, Notepad has become this monster it has, it, it takes a lot longer to start, it take, it, it just clunkier to use. They've, they've turned it into something that it's not, that it never should have been. This bumbling monster 
to edit plain text files. Like really guys, I mean, did you really have to rewrite the program just to make it so that undo did more than one level of undo? I mean, did you, did you really have to rewrite the program so that you could do something more intelligent than a very basic search and replace? I mean, you didn't have to. If you wanted to add features, you could add features, but you chose not to add features. You chose to rewrite the stupid thing as a so-called modern Windows program, and nobody likes modern Windows programs. Nobody likes them. Nobody, nobody, nobody likes them, okay? They look pretty sometimes, maybe, but they're slow, they're bumbling, they're clunky, they're just, there's a lot of weird quirks that don't make sense, and this is the thing with Windows 8 and then 10 with the, the UWP or Metro or Modern, whatever you want to call them, whatever they're calling them this year, the new app style that replaces Win32, good old-fashioned Windows APIs. <clears throat> they changed. They changed so much, and you bounce between, say, the old calculator from Windows 7 and the new modern calculator in Windows 10. They're completely different programs. Now, granted, a calculator is one of the last things that should be difficult. Um, a calculator should be fairly consistent regardless of where you run it. I mean, the task of a frigging calculator is pretty straightforward. We've had a few decades to figure out what a calculator looks like, guys. <clears throat> and to its credit, the Windows 10 calculator, it, it does retain the basics of a calculator. My problem is that the Windows 10 calculator is not the Windows 7 calculator. It's big, flat, ugly. Some of the buttons and features have changed. The layouts have changed. The way that history looks has changed. And, and one of the biggest problems for me is just that overall it doesn't behave the same way. It doesn't look the same way. It doesn't behave the same way. <clears throat> and I really hate that everything is bigger in a so-called modern application than it is in a standard application. Everything has to be larger for some reason. Everything has to be bulky. It has to look, you know, chunky, take up more space than it actually needs. A lot of empty white space. <clears throat> but what happens is over time you adjust to the crap factor, okay? When you use something, you if it changes, you eventually adjust to the differences in how it works and you get used to the new workflow. But here's the problem. It takes intellectual investment, not intellectual, but it takes a time and effort investment to learn. A learning curve is not free. You have to expend personal effort to change, to match the new way. <clears throat> and with Windows 10 and 11, what I've noticed is that, and, and just modern programs in general, change is constant. The churn never fucking stops. It never ends, bros. It never fucking stops. So what am I supposed to do? You know, I've got these programs that I use on a constant basis. And they can't stop screwing with them. Just, and, and I actually have settled on programs that don't do that as much. But just in general, like you work with um, Microsoft Office, you have no idea what they're going to fuck with in the next three years. Every three years, Microsoft Office changes the way it looks. Microsoft Office moves stuff around. Microsoft Office changes, changes something, changes where the settings are, changes where the about screen is, <clears throat> changes where the formatting stuff goes, or... X, Y, or Z, you know, in, in 2007, they discarded the menu and toolbar paradigm for the so-called ribbon, which is really just a tabbed fat toolbar with, with like tool pods and shit, you know, which frankly was stupid. It takes up more space to do the same thing instead of just laying everything out. And I can kind of sort of understand what they were going for. There are some merits to the change. But it was a radical change in how Office looked and worked. And a lot of people hated it, and justifiably so. 
<coughs> um, arguably LibreOffice, which retains the Office 2003 and prior style toolbar system, is a better program because it, it still has all the standard functions where they've always been. But in Office 20, uh, 20, 2007, they changed to the ribbon. In Office 2010, they changed the way the ribbon looked. They changed where other things were located. In Office 2013, they shuffled them around again and started flattening things to make it even worse. In Office 2016, they changed it again. and They just keep changing it. Every few years, the ribbon has to change. Things have to move around. Options have to not be... And it's, it's not like you can't find bold or italic. The extremely common stuff still where it belongs. Yay for consistency. But as soon as you need to deal with headers and footers, you know, tables, uh, coloring the, the cells in tables, <coughs> you know, insert an object or do something even more exotic, like, I don't know, pivot tables in Excel. As soon as you have to do something that's not one of the extremely common, simple features, they've moved it. They've screwed with it. Um, let's say you need to change some macro security setting or whatever to be able to make a document function. Well, they keep changing the locations of where the settings are for, you know, add-ons or macros. They keep changing the way that the security stuff looks. It, they, they can't stop screwing with it. In Outlook, they changed the way that you manage accounts. It used to be you could add an account, and the add account and change account stuff was the same, and you could basically manage your data files, your accounts, everything from one mail control panel. Now they have the, the simplified, modern way of adding accounts that tries to do everything for you. They make it hard to get to where you can set everything up manually and get to advanced settings. <clears throat> they, um, there are some things you can't do in the modern setup that require the advanced settings to even be able to do. It's just absurd. It's so absurd how much they've changed it and, and to what benefit. Because that's the thing. It's like, oh, it's a, it's a simpler setup. Well, look, it's a whole hell of a lot easier to present like eight blanks and ten checkbox and drop down things and then tell the user do this you know fill this in here fill this in here fill this in here fill this in here and the user follow those steps fill this in fill this in fill this in fill this in hit next should work you're done you're done now <coughs> name email oh let's try to find those servers for you and now directions are like, if it did work, then do this. If it didn't work, then do this. So now you're branching. Now you're making the directions more complicated based on what they see. And then, oh, if you need to get into these manual settings, then you do this, 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 and this, and then you go to... They've made it more complicated by making it more simple. And that seems to be... That's always been the problem with Macs, but that seems to be the problem with PCs now, too and phones for that matter. The simplification of things makes it harder to actually get stuff done. And then, on top of that, they move everything around. They change the way that it works. They change the way that it looks. Nothing can look the same, nothing can act the same. Um, in Windows 11, in Windows 10 and 11, um, I use Windows X, which is right-clicking the Start button, which, by the way, doesn't have start in front of it anymore. So when I say start button, half the people don't know what I'm talking about because it doesn't even say start anymore. It's just like the window button at the bottom left. <clears throat> Instead of saying click start, I have to say in the bottom left corner where the Windows logo is, right click it. Because they took the word start away. Why they do that? Don't know. Stupid. Did it a long time ago, but still stupid. It's a start button, and by having that word there, a signal that if I say go to the start button, will you look for the word start? Oh, that was easy. They changed that in Vista. And yeah, I've gotten used to the crap factor, but I still have to tell some people what I mean when I say right click on, star on the start button or on start. But if you right click the start button in Windows 8 and later, you get a very handy menu that I wish was actually in earlier versions. It gives you all of the most important, super secret Windows administrative this, that, and the others. 
and it's all right there you know disk management device manager apps and features or whatever they call that this week well here's the problem with that <clears throat> when they change what that thing at the top is called Originally, it was programs and features because it carried over from 7 and 8, right? Well, then they changed it to, like, uh, apps and features. But if I hit WinX and then F, that shortcut would always work. Well, in, like, 22H2 edition of Windows 11, it's now installed apps. It's now WinX P, not WinX F. So they renamed it unnecessarily, and now my shortcut doesn't work. The shortcut combo that I have learned for years have been using has changed. So now, whether, you know, I, if I'm on Windows 11 and I hit WinX F and it doesn't work, that's when I realize I have to do it the other way. And so then I have to change my behavior, it slows me down, and just lather, rinse, repeat just do this over and over and over again they change one little thing's location or they, they remove a control panel they move a setting or or they change the way that like a window works or whatever they, they always have to screw with the settings it, it happens on phones it happens on Windows 10 it doesn't matter you download the updated version of an app all of a sudden something has changed I have an app on my phone called Fuelio um, not Fuelly a lot of people used Fuelly back in the day to track their gas usage I use Fulio, which keeps all the data local, doesn't require an online account, and does a pretty good job. In a Fulio update, they changed it to where you previously had a button, um, I think it was at the bottom, that you would hit to add, to add something. And then it would pop a menu that covered the whole bottom. They changed it to a circle in the bottom right corner with a plus sign. <clears throat> now, okay, and that pops up a menu. Same basic menu, that's fine, except the circle's in the corner. The previous menu was across the bottom, but now the circle's in the corner, and it obscures the bottom right item of whatever you see on the screen, instead of being its own carve away. So now you've got some information obscured, which the way it's laid out, they don't really put information over there, so okay, that's not a big deal. But now the muscle memory where I tap the bottom of the screen anywhere has to change to tap the bottom right corner but not too far in the corner. <clears throat> so now instead of targeting a large bar striking across the entire bottom of the screen, my fat thumb has to target a smaller circular area that does not go to the edges. It looks better, like visually, the whole circle thing looks better, but it's not actually better because now I have to retrain myself on how to do it. And even to this day, when I use this app, I have to change my behavior sometimes. I'll still expect that bottom bar to be there. And it's been changed for like half a year, I think. <clears throat> Long enough I don't remember, but the point is they changed the interface, and now I have to change it, and they changed the words, too. Like, it used to be plus and, like, um, gas or um, something like that, and now it's, like, plus and, like, refueling. They changed the word. So now, not only do I have to target a button differently, I also have to target a revised wording that didn't actually help. Oh, uh, you know, it, was, it said gas. So you're gonna add what, like a, a refueling? Why, why did you change that? You didn't need to change that. Everyone knows what you mean. Me plus, and he's like add, add gas to the list of stuff or expenses. It, it was just not something that ever needed to change, and they changed in any fucking way. <clears throat> and to this day, because I spent so long using the old way, I still have deficits as a result of this change pulling the rug out from under my brain and forcing me to do things a new way <clears throat> a new way that wasn't necessary that didn't improve anything other than maybe oh we think it looks better this look this has a nicer look to it to us 
this is a nicer wording to us. Yeah, except someone who's actually been using your app now has a harder time using it. Okay. And I understand that sometimes things need to be changed. When you make changes like this, they need to be slow, as small as possible, metered out over time so that skill sets can adapt to the changes without too much pain. But in the case of this Fulio app, it's, it was unnecessary. <clears throat> they didn't make an actual effective change in the behavior. They just changed the wording and the look. Design, just little graphical design changes that might look prettier, and maybe to new users it might look a little bit prettier. But the problem is it's trend chasing. In the end, it's just trend chasing. It's a chasing a mobile design trend. Well, people don't use big old rectangular blocks. You know, they don't carve up the screen into these big chunky rows anymore. You know, now, instead of that, that they've got this thing where they have hovering elements that hover over whatever this is, is underneath it. So, you know, because it looks better somehow. Somehow, somehow that looks better. Um, and, and somehow, like, is this going to, like, benefit the new users? Because it hurts the old users. So the question is, do the new users benefit? Well, if I hit the uh, add thing at the bottom, the rectangle, <coughs> versus the plus sign, well, if I'm a new user learning either way, there's no real difference. But if I'm an existing user, it hurts me. And if I'm a new user, I will find it practically easier to target a rectangle at the bottom than a hovering circle. So it minimally harms new users. That guy is going way too fucking fast. But um, it hurts new users minimally. It hurts old users more because now they have to learn a whole new way of doing the thing and they have to unlearn the old way. So there's two factors to it. And, and that's why these decisions, they don't make any sense. I wonder, most of the time, I mean, I joke about this, like <clears throat> these kinds of changes, they feel like it's nothing more than some designer center or design centric guy or set of guys at some business somewhere or even girls at some business somewhere you know, that's making, that's making the app or the program or whatever, trying to justify their employment or screwing with things because they want to feel like they've done something. And I guess ultimately my takeaway that I want to give to you all <coughs> is that in user interfaces, doing something is bad. Changing an interface is pretty much universally bad unless the interface is already really bad. But changing an established interface that generally works well for the majority of users is bad. It is always bad. Sometimes that change is necessary. But let me give you an example, and it's not an interface example, but it is a software example of how you handle changes like this. In my program, JDupes, the duplicate scanner, I change the way that the capital X um, parameter, option, whatever, works. It originally was like X for big exclude, but I changed it to extended filtering, capital X, X extended filter. The reason is that previously I was doing things like size, like exclude size, that's greater than or equal to with like size plus equals. But I kept catching myself using this expecting size plus equals colon and a number to mean include size greater than or equal to the number. <clears throat> so in my own brain, the guy who created the program, the guy who actually put the code in, you know, the originator of the feature, I was getting tripped up by it being an exclusion instead of an inclusion. So, what I did was I inverted the meaning and I wanted to add other things too that had nothing to do with exclusion necessarily. 
So I changed the name to Extended Filters, and I put a warning in the program. I put a warning in the next minor version. The meaning of dash capital X will change uh, in the next version. Um, it will change to a new syntax. Watch out. And then in the next version, I change the meaning of the thing to the new meaning. And I put a big, fat, ugly warning every time someone tried to use the dash capital X. I put a big fat warning that said, hey, the meanings have completely changed. Read the manual or you could lose data or whatever because I've completely flipped what it actually means. <clears throat> and this warning will go away in the next version. And then a version or two later, I took the warning away. And that's how you handle that transition. You make it so that if somebody tries to do something and they're used to the old way, that they're made aware that a change is happening, that they have time to adjust to the change happening. They're, they're alerted to it, they can adjust to it, and they're reminded of it in a clear way and can figure out, discover, if you will, what to do about it when the change happens, like how they handle things under this new regime of interface. But it needs to be slow, and it needs to be careful. <clears throat> An established interface that a lot of people are used to using, that is working for them, should generally stay in place, even if a better idea comes to your mind. If you think of a better way to implement it, like to make it look, the weighting of that better has to be so much heavier than keeping the established workflows from becoming a problem. And and th that this 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 these people man they just can't drive for shit. I swear to god, I just saw two cars try to whack each other. But uh yeah, it, I don't understand what it is today, man. People just can't drive for nothing. You can get over. Your turn signal is still on, Jesus Christ. This guy's a fucking idiot. I'm not dealing with this crap. Sorry about that. Sometimes you gotta drive like a jackass in Greensboro. Oh, come on. Oh my god. This is like the worst part of this highway. It's 70 miles an hour here, and people can't drive for shit. Like, I'm in this Equinox's blind spot right here, and I wouldn't be surprised if he sideswiped me. Yeah, so interfaces are nothing compared to trying to drive in Greensboro on this friggin' highway on a Friday. That's just stupid. Stupid of me to drive here, isn't it? Alright, but back to what I was trying to say before everyone on the road decided I was murder-worthy. Um, <clears throat> okay. So you need to make changes slowly over time, and they need to be worth it. They need to be pretty desperately worth it. And that's gone out the window, that it doesn't matter. Um, one more notable thing that has really pissed me off, um, and this is a major pain point for me as a Windows um, system administrator, as a, a person who refurbishes, repairs, and so on, computers all the time for consumers and businesses. It used to be in Windows 7 you had a set program access and defaults control panel <coughs> and you had a default programs control panel and they had links to bounce between them. But in default programs, this is a biggie. You could either pick by the extension, by the URL prefix, or by the program how to associate things with programs. So you could associate certain URLs like MMS colon or HTTP colon, HTTPS colon, URL colon, you know, all these different URL schemes could be associated with programs. You could associate PDF extension, JPG, JPEG, 
you know, MP4, AVI, TXT. You could associate by extension or, <clears throat> and this was always the biggie for me, there was a control panel where you could pick a program out of a whole list of programs on the left. This is default programs. Pick a program. It'll say this program has X or all out of um, 147 or whatever of its possible defaults. For me, Media Player Classic Home Cinema was the biggie. It supports over 100 file types. <clears throat> I cannot go through each extension, pick it, and say, here, associate with MPCHC. It's too much fucking time. I'm not doing it. It's stupid to expect me to do that. In Windows 7 and 8 and 8.1 and 10 before a certain feature update, you could still go to Control Panel, go to Default Programs, and you could pick. Specifically, um, I want um, this program, Media Player Classic Home Cinema, and it would have a button there. It, you could, Two buttons. One of them was pick which extensions are associated with this program, and it would give you check boxes where you could associate individual extensions out of all of them, like cherry pick, <clears throat> but it was all just the ones for that program, and you could just click, click, click if you wanted to cherry pick, or, and this is what's, what's pissing me off, is there's no button, there hasn't been for years, in 10 or 11, that lets you go, this program, I want you to associate everything with this program. And in 10, I'd love a way to also say, and fucking stop asking me if I want to reassociate it with something new. But they took it away in 10, and I found a guru meditation. I found a, a GUID or CLS ID or whatever. <coughs> there was this like run DLL32 or whatever, ma this magic code that you could pass to like control.exe or something. Just some random code that would bring up the default programs control panel that was still there, but they took the icon away for. And they took the link away in the default apps, whatever, association settings panel. You could no longer get to it directly, but there was still a thing, and I think it was like 1803, that you could run that would bring that up, and it still did what it was supposed to do. Then I think it was 1809, they took that away too. So when you try to invoke it, <coughs> excuse me, using this other method that I found, it would kick you over to the settings panel that was missing that vital setting. For several years, I have not been able to take one program that has a lot of defaults, go anywhere in Windows, and click a button, and have that button associate every file type that program supports with that program. That feature has been gone. It never came back. They removed it. They removed the ability to get to it even through arcane, oh, it's dark, um, even through uh, these arcane, magical, techno, administrator, woohoo ways. Um, it's not important enough for me to try to find some kind of amazing workaround for, but it is important enough that I'm pissed. Pissed. Did I even have to deal with it? So yeah, that that just to this day pisses me off, and and it's just it speaks to a greater trend among all operating system designers. This is Android, Windows, iOS, Mac OS, <coughs> everything except Linux. You just fuck you, basically. They might as well just say, fuck you, we're going to fuck with you all day long. Oh, just, we don't care. We don't care that you're used to using your computer a certain way. We don't care that you have a workflow that works a certain way. We don't care that you're going to have to relearn how to do half this stuff. We don't care that you lose this ability and we didn't add it back somewhere else you can learn. Just fucking with everything. Hosing your settings. Just, just... Everything, just not being consistent. A complete lack of consistency, loss of discoverability. This has become the norm in computing. This is one of a few major reasons that I, a person who grew up fucking in love with computers and technology, obsessed, 
to the point that it was my world. It has always been my life. Technology was amazing. Computers were amazing. And I loved tech more than anything in the entire world. And I've just kind of started to secretly hate it. I hate it. I hate technology. And it's not that technology can't do it. Because if you install Linux Mint, <coughs> for example, it doesn't have to be Mint, but if you install Linux Mint, a lot of these problems go away. Does Linux Mint fundamentally change the way that, that the settings and whatever work in Cinnamon? Do, do they hide options? Do they do they have this schizophrenic old style control panel, new style settings panel? Let's just try to migrate stuff over, but oh wait, legacy stuff, oh wait, we can't do it. Where you have to hunt all over the place to find settings? No. No, that's not there. Have the settings changed in five years, six years, eight years? Yeah, but this much. <coughs> The beauty of Linux is that a lot of people use it and contribute to it and give their input on it. And if it ain't broke, a lot of people don't fix it. They just don't. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And in Linux, because the people, a lot of times, who are working on the thing are also using the thing they're working on because a lot of it's, you know, passion, um, it's scratching your own itch. Like, I didn't write JDoops for other people. I wrote it for me and then decided to publish it one day. You know, I was going to keep it to myself, but I released it to the world. But it remains my passion project, and I prioritize fixes that I want over fixes that other people want that don't help me. But because people dog food, which is when you use the product you try to give other people, when you actually are a user of your own product and you have to deal with it every day, because so many of these people that have all of these, um, all of this control use their own product all the time, they are motivated to not fuck with it. They are motivated to not change it, to not make it worse, you know, to keep things consistent, to make things so they can find it. No, everybody's not a user interface expert, but in the world of Linux, one of the beautiful things is that while there are some weird inconsistencies, like between the Qt framework and the KDE framework and the, um, uh, what do you call it, FLTK, you know, blah, 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 <coughs> um, GTK in general, just there are a few of these things that kind of give it a schizophrenic behavioral thing. A lot of those have been patched up and they're not as bad as they are in Windows when you try to find a setting to change. Um, they don't mess with things. They don't screw with you because they are the users too. And I do wish that Linux became a more mainstream thing that, you know, I guess the problem is that when something goes wrong in Linux, you have to edit text files. You have to do arcane stuff. And that's really, that, that plus the fact that you can pick all these different desktop environments which makes it inconsistent if you if you have a different one, you have all these different ways to support. <clears throat> there are reasons that only having one desktop environment, only having one type of settings panel, only having one option is beneficial. Right? Yeah, screw you too, you piece of shit. But there's reasons that not changing things helps. A lot of it helps with support. Because now you don't have to figure out, you know, oh, do you have this or that or that or that or that? And then I have like this, this giant mix of 3D flowcharts crossing all over the place as to just steps on how to get something simple done. You know, all that goes out the window, right? And Linux is beautiful. I mean, I've, I've been using Mint on a laptop for a couple months um, because you, normally I've just done it on servers, but now I have a laptop that has it too. And, and it's been wonderful. And I want to see it flourish and more people use it. And a lot of these problems go away. But guess what? The problem with Linux is that it just does not have that momentum. As it is with any social thing, and this is actually why I think social media networks of sufficient size need to be treated as extensions of the federal government, something social requires social momentum. 
there have to be enough people that just happen to flood to it for whatever reason, usually trends, not because it's better, but because all the, all the other people have gone to it. It's why Google's little Google Plus with circles and crap failed. Social stuff does not work like a normal free market. There, it's trends. It's social weight. The more people there are, the more you know monopolistic it can become. But the same is true of Windows and Mac OS, and and even Android is like weird. But the Android core is still this very um, Google run um, monoculture, really. And monocultures are good for things like support, but they're bad because a monoculture can persist due to social weight. <coughs> Linux benefits from not having that monoculture. Linux is the polar opposite of monoculture. But people won't go to it because it's not a monoculture. It's kind of an unsolvable problem. It's why the, Linux de the year of the Linux desktop has been a joke for decades because it's just not there and it may never be there because it's not this big, homogenous, standardized everything. And it's gotten a lot better, but there's so much variance. There's so much just inconsistency under the hood when anything goes wrong. And just even with the interfaces used, with what program someone's using, there's, there's so much choice that you can basically choose your way out of being able to support with limited resources the ability of someone to use it. So anyway, I, I don't, I'm kind of running out of steam and I also need to stop for a second. So I think that's where I'm going to end this and my voice is kind of giving out, I think. Anyway, thank you for listening this long. Uh, I'm going to cut this bitch off and hope that I didn't record it too dark with this awful blown out overcast sky for you to see my pretty face. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. You know the drill. Share it with all your buddies because they definitely want to hear some fucking old fat bald guy talk for 40 minutes. And I'll catch you on the flip side, homies. Later.